Yes. All right. We have the, the prayers going for our brother Darren and and Faye and well there's there's the list is getting extensive. Like Randy's uh, announcements list is getting longer and longer and longer. So you're gonna have five minutes for your sermon. Five minutes? Okay. Well, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Well, I told I was at Darren's huh? house for seven hours on Saturday, or not there. Uh, I was at Chuck's house for seven hours on Saturday, and I told him I said, "Man, I haven't finished. I gotta get home and finish my sermon tomorrow." Or no, on Friday, and I said, uh, "I said, well, I, hope I might have to just preach the devotion." I said because I said you guys are taking up too much of my time. We went over to Chuck and Diane's house, and Diane was uh, training up Christy in the art of sewing, and, and, and Christy's never sewed a thing in her life, so like. To the point to where we got our sewing machine for Mother's Day, and we unboxed it at Diane's house. <laughs> so she was getting, like, the entire uh, lesson. Turn around, let's see how Christy did. Oh, no, not yet, not okay. yet. <laughs> but they made this cool little bag, you know. And I told her, I was like, hey, I was like, you're starting out pretty good. I was like, you know, your first bag turned out better than my first nightstand when I started doing woodworking. I had to cover up a lot of mistakes with wood putty. <laughs> All right, well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 19. I told you uh, last week, because there's lots of questions uh, as we were uh, talking about some marriage, divorce, or remarriage, but it was towards the end of the class, and I said, we're going to just start over, we're going to look at this topic from the beginning, and we're going to look to answer questions. Um, and it actually, it actually, it bodes well, because what were we talking about the last two Wednesday nights? Do you guys remember? As we were going over those sheets, the topic of authority. Who has authority in Scripture? God. Who has authority in the church today? God. Right? The Lord. God does. And so Jesus said, go by, 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 you could show the world that you're disciples of mine if you keep my commandments, right? And so we know that the Lord has all authority. So if we just allow the word to speak for itself, then things become clear. Does that make sense? And so I told Christy, as we were talking this week, I said, it actually worked out well how this came about, and then what we're talking about on Wednesday nights will then coincide with this. Because as we start to study this out, the Jews are going to have questions for Jesus, as they have throughout the Gospels that we read, and Jesus will answer questions, but then he'll often say this, but, but I say to you, when the Jews have their thoughts, and Jesus says, but I say to you, what does that mean? <laughs> but takes over. He has all authority. He has all authority? It means what he says is more important. What he says goes. You might want to pay attention, right? It's important that as we study this out, we understand that at two times in, the, in, in human history, we had a universal law. There was universal law during the patriarchal period, yes, Right? Was yep. God's law for all mankind during that time? Yeah. Yes. Yep. And then there was the law of Moses that came about around 1500 B.C. And that was for who? The Jews. For the Jews and the Jews only. Right? For the Hebrew people. And so there was a divide. Right? There was a, the, the law caused strife. It caused ill will. It caused enmity, the scriptures say, between Gentiles and Jews. And now, once again, we are back under a universal law. Is there anybody on the planet today that the law of Christ does not apply to? So once again, we're under universal law, right? The law of Moses was nailed to the cross. We learn about that in Colossians. When we study out the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it's an emotional topic because, well, if you were to look at any of the latest statistics, over 50%, it used to be right around 50%. Now it's much more than 50%. It's probably upper 50%, uh, maybe 56, 57% of all first marriages end in divorce. divorce. So do you think it's an important topic? Yes. Because God gives instructions on said topic. And we need to understand what those instructions are because if we live under a universal law, does the law of God or the law of Christ only apply to just people in the church? Or does it apply to all mankind? How do we know that? How can we know that? Say again, a little louder. Scriptures tell us that. Scriptures tell us that. 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that, right? 
And so we know that there are many scriptures that actually speak to that, right? When we stand before God in judgment, and you look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says you will all stand before God in judgment. John chapter 12 and 48, what's going to judge you in the last day? Jesus says the words that I speak is what will judge you in the last day. Do you think it's important then to pay attention? That's why it's so important that we understand our mission. And the mission of the church was what again? Bring people to Christ. Bring people to Christ. But the mission, more specifically, oh. is to go. Yeah. Go out into the world and let them know that there is a law. There is a God. He's the living God. And he has given commands that we will all be judged by. And we are to try to get people to repent, to turn away from sin. Yes? Because God will judge them in the end. When we look at this topic, I'm, I will tell you that there is a split in the church, in the Lord's church. <coughs> It's probably a 60-40 split. And the split tends to come in regards to baptism. They'll say this. On the one group, the 60% says that the law of Christ is applicable to all people that are, abort that are alive today. All people who are post-cross, the law of Christ applies to them. They live under the law of Christ. right? Whether you're in the church or out of the church, you live according to the law of Christ. But then there's the other 40% that would say, no. They'll say, yes, all people are under the law of Christ, except for when you get to this one thing called marriage and divorce. Because they don't want to cause any stumbling blocks for somebody who wants to come to Christ. And so the other 40% will say, well, you may have been divorced two or three times before you come to Christ, and baptism washes away your sins. But baptism doesn't wash away it's not the remission of marriages, it's the remission of sin. And so what is the sin in the marriage? If you had multiple divorces that were unscriptural, it's the sin of adultery. And it, does bapt can baptism wash away the sin of adultery? Yes. But if you continue to live in adultery, then the baptism doesn't, can't continue to wash it away because you're living in sin. And so there's two groups within the church. Like I said, it's like a 60-40 split. And so there's the divide. It's this, this topic has divided churches. It's divided elderships. It's divided ministers. It's divided many people because there's a, different, a difference of opinions, right? But the difference of opinions doesn't necessarily come from Scripture. The difference of opinions come from the, the idea that it's an emotional topic. Because as humans, don't we want what we want? And many times, aren't we going to try to keep searching the scriptures until I can find a passage that's going to tell me that I could have what I want? Yeah. Right? And so let's just allow the word of God to speak for itself here this morning. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 19. Let's start actually in verse, uh, verse 1. As we get to Matthew chapter 19, and as we start to, to cover this out, the Jews are coming to Jesus, and they're going to have a question for Jesus. And we'll see how Jesus answers this question. Because remember, who has all authority in the church? Jesus. Okay? Matthew 19 says this. Starting in verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And a large crowd followed him, and he, and he healed them there. Some of the Pharisees... Oops, sorry about that. And he healed them there. Some of the Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Make sure that we pause and we understand what the question is here. Here the, G the Jews are coming and asking Jesus, Is it uh, applicable to divorce my wife for any reason? Right? So any reason would cover any and all things, right? And then notice what Jesus says. And Jesus answered and said, Have you not read... That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. What's Jesus talking about? Creation. He's talking about creation. So he's going all the way back to the beginning. He's not talking about the law of Moses. Jesus goes back to the beginning. He goes back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, right? And so you look at this, and he says in verse 5, And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so they no longer are two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. 
you look at these first six verses before we move on any further, okay? The Jews are coming, and they're asking about questions of marriage and divorce under their own law. But Jesus takes it a step further. He doesn't just answer the question in regards to their law. He goes back to the patriarchal law. He goes back to the law that was in place, the universal law, and God's expectation for mankind all the way back to the beginning. Okay? And so you look at how this continues on in verse 7. They said to him, Why then did Moses uh, command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And then here it is in verse 9. Jesus says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, and you look at verse 9, the word immorality in the Greek is pornea. That's where we get our, our, our English word pornography. But it's sexual immorality. Okay, That's what that word is, pornea. So it's sexual immorality. Except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. The, the disciples said to Jesus, if the relationship of the man and his wife is like this, it's better not to even marry. But Jesus said to his disciples, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way by their, from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. What did we just learn here in Matthew chapter 19? Remember what we said. Who has all authority in the Lord's church? Jesus, Jesus does. Jesus gives spe a specific answer to this question. They said, can we divorce our wives for any reason? Meaning that, you know what? I just don't like Christy that much anymore. She was really getting on my nerves lately. I'm just going to put her away. And because of the hardness of my heart, yes. Well, I'll let you know how the first hem job goes, and then we'll see. <laughs> yeah, and Diane told me when I was talking about hemming the pants. She's like, well, we're a long ways from that. We're just working on something simple here. But no, they made it cool back. But let's not digress. You look at who has all authority. Why do I keep mentioning who has all authority? Why is that important? Well, there is perversion, but the scriptures are crystal clear, right? Yeah, you're, what you're saying is inherently not wrong, but the point is the scriptures, the scriptures are crystal clear. Who has all authority in the church? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus alone. Not the men, not the women. Jesus. All right? So Jesus gives law. What were you going to say something? There are many, many congregations who are afraid to teach on this subject. And I've always appreciated what the Apostle Paul told uh, the, the Ephesian elders and he told other individuals. He says, your blood, and he told, like, as he would preach at different uh, synagogues, he would, if they would turn him away, would not listen to him, he would say, your blood be on your own heads. For I did not cease to declare the whole counsel of God unto you. So he's basically saying, I gave you the entirety of the teaching. If you turn away from that, your blood be on your own hands. Make sense? And so, what is difficult to understand about Matthew chapter 19? They said, can I divorce my wife for any reason? And Jesus went all the way back to the beginning, and he says, don't you remember that when a, 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 a husband or a, a man leaves his mother and father, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, they are to cleave to their wife. What God has joined together, let no man separate. When you enter into a marriage covenant, it's between three parties. Who? You and the Lord and the wife. Husband, wife, God. Is God going to hold you to that covenant? Yes. <clears throat> it's not husband, wife, and state. 
It's not husband and wife in the state. And we know that because can you be divorced uh, legally in the eyes of the state, the government, and yet be uh, in an unscriptural marriage in the eyes of God? There's a scriptural example of that. Uh, when we look at the scriptural example of that, we see it in, uh, what chapter was it? Uh, let's turn over to uh, Mark, chapter, uh, Mark chapter 6. When you look over to Mark chapter 6, and we see there's an, a, 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 a biblical example of this. In Mark chapter 6, we're going to look at verse uh, 17. Uh, we'll start actually in verse 14. Notice what it says in John chapter 6, starting in verse 14. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 14. And King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known, and the people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work with him. But others are saying he is Elijah, and others are saying that he is the prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself had sent him away and had John arrested and bound in prison in account, on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. What did he mean by it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife? You see, you see, there was civil law, and then there's God's law. Lewis? No, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no So, go ahead. No, I'll, I'm good. All right. So, there's civil law, and there's God's law. You can be married under civil law and be pleasing in man's sight, but you can't be always necessarily pleasing under God's sight. Because he, he says it is not lawful for you on, in God's sight to have your brother's wife. So... How do we make sense of all the problems that we see? Well, what if I just f fall out of love with my wife? Is that a scriptural reason for, uh, for remarriage? Is it a scriptural reason for divorce and remarriage? What if I uh, just, you know, she's uh, emotionally abusive to me? You see, there's lots of questions. I'm going to get to Leslie first. So when a, a husband died in the Old Testament, Yep. And the wife was there, and a brother was supposed to take on his wife's responsibility as a responsibility. How does all that play into this? Because the wife is dead. So let's flip over to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 answers that question. The good thing about scriptures, God doesn't leave us wanting. He doesn't leave us guessing. He gives us the information to answer said questions, right? And there are certain sins that God overlooked in the nation of Israel to bring about the seed line, to bring about the Christ. And that's why when we think about certain things God overlooked, that's why Acts 17, 30, and 31 is important. He says, for the times of ignorance are over. I now declare all people everywhere repent. But when you look over to Romans chapter 7, let's read here in these first, uh, probably the first three, four verses. Romans chapter 7 says this. Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So you see there that there's two things that dissolve a marriage. What are those two things that, uh, in God's eyes, scripturally dissolves a marriage? Death and adultery. Death and adultery. Is that, is that difficult to understand? It's pretty clear, right? But where it becomes uncomfortable for a lot of elderships and ministers as we have to talk with individuals is a lot of people make a mess of their lives. And there's a lot of different problems that arise in marriage because instead of following 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where we're not, we shouldn't yoke ourselves to unbelievers, whether it's in business dealings or whether it's in 
a marriage, we tend to think, and I've heard people say it, I'll, I'll, I'll get her to come to my side of thinking. I'll get her to believe what I believe. I'll, I'll get her to change. And then vice, and vice versa. Women will say the same things. Le Leslie? So when, oh, Kelly, you're next. Oh, go, go Kelly. <coughs> Um, what I was going to say is what sometimes is the problem when someone says you fall out of love or they're mean, well, I'm miserable, God didn't want me to be miserable. The couples need to correct their attitudes and behaviors that brought them to that conflict. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They don't want to work on that. And obviously I'm an open book. I am uh, guilty of that being married at a young age and getting divorced, you know, four years later and stuff. Um, and I used to say to myself and a lot of other people have said, oh, you're so sweet, you're so kind. You're going to find a good man one day. You're gonna, and I'm like, you're right. Why would God want me to be sad and alone forever? That's what I used to always say. And then um, I was helping this lady with Little Dress for Africa, and she had some crazy things she was telling me. And then I sat with you, and um, it may not be what I wanted to hear. It was a hard pill to swallow. But um, in the eyes of the Lord, no, I cannot remarry, and I must just love and serve the Lord. And I'm not alone. I'm not alone. God You're not alone at all. I'm not. God's with me. God's God with you. God's always with me, and I have my daughter, my yep. family. So it was a hard pill to swallow when I went home, and I was, are you sure Dave's right about what he's saying? And, my, and, we went <laughs> and um, it was hard, but um, I made peace with it and with the Lord. And, I mean, it's, it's just that's the way it is. Yeah, because your original thinking was, like many people, I have desires of the flesh. And the flesh wants what the flesh wants. And I'm going to look for somebody to tell me what I want in order to then have what I want. Right? Because I don't want to have to live alone. I don't want to have to, uh, you know what I mean, have sexual frustrations. I don't want to have these different things. And so I'm going to then look for somebody to tell me what I want to hear. And many people do that. And so, Leslie, go ahead. So when it was okay for in the Old Testament for men to have multiple wives, when did that stop? Okay. And when did it become okay with God to not take on another yeah. wife if, if, if he's fulfilling a duty for marriage to keep yeah. the family line going? There was two times in the Bible, as I said earlier, where we have a universal law. Patriarchal period, where there, ever, there, there was no law of Moses. And then there was the Christian period. There is the Christian period. Both of those we have, right? One man... One woman for life. Death separates it. Adultery separates it. The victim of adultery, the one who was cheated on, has the right to remarry in the eyes of God. The one who committed the adultery has not that right. That's part of the consequences of the sin. And that's why sin has consequences, right? I can be forgiven. I think of the Aubrey case. Uh, there's the, the gentleman that was murdered. Uh, the police officer went into his apartment, thought she was in her apartment, and shot him, thought he was breaking in, killed him. The brother, uh, of, uh, during the court case, went up to her and was, just gave her the biggest hug, and there was this big emotional mess, and they were crying, and, and he says, listen, he goes, I can't speak for the rest of my family, but I forgive you. I know my brother would want me to forgive you. But that doesn't mean she didn't still have to suffer the consequences of the action, Okay. There's consequences to sin. So back to your question then, in regards to in the times of, of, of like the concubines and the times of the multiple marriages and things like that, God never once, there's not one passage of scripture that anybody could turn to that God gave them those rights. Man chose to do those things, right? If you go back what Jesus said, when Jesus said, can I divorce my wife for any reason? God says, and he went all the way back to the beginning. He gave them the original attention of the law. And if you go back to Matthew 19 here, why does Jesus say that Moses allowed them to put their wives away? Because of the hardness of their hearts. What was the point of the Jewish people? In, in, in the history of the, of the Bible, what was the point of the Jewish people? To make the pathway for Christ to come. A pathway to bring the seed, the Christ, into the world. God overlooked certain sins for a period but then you go over to Acts chapter 17 for a quick second. And as we look at Acts chapter 17, I want you to remember what it says here. Because it's very important here. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, notice what it says. 
Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance. What was the times of ignorance? That was the Mosaic period. Because the Jews were one hard-headed people. How many times did God have to punish them? How many times did God have to cause them to be taken captive by a, by a pagan nation? Because of, the, because of the violation after violation after violation of the covenants that they freely entered into. They accepted the covenant relationship with God. And yet they violated it constantly. But God, in order to bring the seed line during a certain period, overlooked certain things. Because of the hardness of their hearts, Moses allowed those things, as Jesus said. But here, we see the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. He does the same thing today. Yes. God is patient with us. Yes. And he wants us all to come to repentance. Absolutely. So God is merciful. God yeah. is patient. We don't know when the Lord's going to return. But he hasn't returned. No. Nope. And those of us living in sin or unknowledgeable about the gospel have the opportunity to seek and search yeah. and change that. Absolutely. And see, this is the problem that we have. We have the Old Testament with all its flaws, right? Does the Old Testament and the people of the Old Testament have flaws? And we now in the New Testament under Christ will use the Old Testament to try to justify why it's acceptable to do certain things today. Well, they had multiple wives, but in the Christian dispensation, under the law of Christ, where is it that says we can have multiple wives? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'll get to you next. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, how many wives does the elder allowed to have? The shepherd, the leader of the church. That's one, one, wife. Wife. one wife. Do you think there's a reason why they specifically mention one wife? So they should have more than one. Because of the error, because of the hardness of the hearts that was taking place amongst God's original chosen people. Uh, Russ. I think even in the Old Testament, when the characters in the Old Testament practiced polygamy, Every time they were in the wrong relationship with God. Yep. And every David and Solomon. Both. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there was not an example of someone in the Bible who acted against God's will yep. to take on more than one wife. Yeah. And if, and if with Russ's point, when you go back, I'll get you next. When you go back and you study out the Old Testament, every time there was multiple wives in the picture, there was a train wreck. Most of David's problems came through the different wives and the children of those other wives in the same thing with Solomon and everybody else. There's not one passage that you could turn to where God endorses polygamy. Abraham got himself into not one. Yep. Uh, yes? I just want to rewind really quick. Because rewind. Because I got a question. So if, say, I was married. Yep. My husband divorces me. Yep. For whatever reason. He doesn't like me, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes and he gets married to someone else. Is my contract then broken? And then and because he is with someone else and he has proved to someone else, would my contract with him and God be broken then? This is what I no. teach. So for, let's flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 for a second. So we get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. We're going to see something here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and then we're going to look at verse uh, 10 and 11. And Paul tells us this, and he wrote to the Corinthians. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, let her remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not send the wife away. You look at the scriptures, right? When it, we're, we're, there's no slaves. Get to you next. There's no slaves. So you and then you. Okay. Try to keep it all in order. Um, there's no slaves in marriage, right? Marriage is something that you enter into a bond with, right? With, with your husband, with your wife, and God. 
If, but I cannot force somebody to remain my spouse. And so what I instruct people, if my wife was to leave me and I was doing everything in my power to love her as Christ loves the church, to cherish her, to treat her with compassion and love and empathy, and she chooses to walk away from me, I instruct those individuals to remain holy, to keep the, to keep the covenant that they entered into. If the, then that individual decides to divorce me, I, I'm doing everything I can to not get a divorce. If they leave me, then you remain pure. You remain pure and you remain consistent with the scriptures. And if that person then goes on to marry another, goes on, has, is involved in sexual relationships, they've committed adultery. Because they're not, you're not, I can't make my spouse stay with me, right? We're not in a slave-master relationship. And so if that individual was to then walk away, you keep yourself pure. And if you keep yourself pure in the eyes of God, I believe that when we look at the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that you're not held in bondage. You'll have the opportunity then, because they broke in the covenant, what's the only two ways you can break the covenant of marriage? Death and adultery. Death and, adultery. and if they left and they commit adultery, because in God's eyes they're still bound to you, Right? They commit adultery, they've broken the bond, they've broken the covenant. Uh, Gina, and then we'll get to Pat. Well, I think I've answered my question. Answered your question? Okay, does that answer your question? Pat. Um, in reading the rest of that, uh, you want, can you read that? Like at least through 15? Mm -hmm. Can we read through 15? Yeah. Sure. Where? Where? Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay. So we read 10 and 11. So let's pick up in 12. But to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, uh, has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, let him not send her away. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and consents to live with her, let her not send the husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are uh, holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So what's your question? Is 15 um, adding to that? Uh, 15? Uh, adultery... Well, there's not unbelieving. So in keeping in context here, what was happening? This was a pagan culture. Uh, and in the pagan culture, many of these pagans came out of paganism into Christianity, and now they found themselves married to what? A pagan spouse. And so now there's a division in the home. But it says there in those verses, if your unbelieving wife or your unbelieving husband re chooses to remain with you, then you remain in the marriage. Why? Because then if you have children, your children have a chance to be holy. It's not the marriage that makes them holy. It's hopefully that the parent doing their job as now a Christian is going to give them Christian influence, Christian teachings, which then has hopefully the opportunity to save that little child's soul. But if they're both raised up in paganism or worldliness, then they're all basically unholy. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, she said what I'm saying. I'm All right, go ahead. Go ahead. But if the unbeliever leaves, let yep. him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. So does yep. that release the person who has come out of the world and has taken on Christ, their spouse is remaining worldly and does not want to live with a Christian. If yep. they leave, does that then release the, the person who's a Christian from their marriage? And that mind? gets back to the answer I just gave to her. It's so, the same question. Because well, if, you, if they haven't committed adultery, they may be pagan in other so ways. That's, so that's the point. So it goes back Unless to they commit adultery. you remain faithful, okay. right? That believing spouse cannot force the unbelieving spouse to stay. They're not a slave. It's not a slave-master relationship. So if the unbelieving spouse wants to leave, I can't make you stay. If I'm doing my part... And I'm loving you like I'm supposed to love you. I'm treating you, treating my wife or my husband as, as Christ would treat the church. I'm living sacrificially. I'm doing everything I can to make you happy. And you leave anyways. I, I keep myself pure. 
I keep myself faithful. If that person never moves on, then you remain single. Because the only thing that separates or uh, that dissolves a marriage covenant is adultery and death. That goes back to what Jesus had to say. Even though this says you're released from your bond. It says released from the bond, yes. But it doesn't say you have the right to remarry. Okay. So you're released from your obligation to that mate. You're not released from your obligation to God. There's a difference. Until death or adultery. To death or adultery. But, and, you can't pay that. and that's what we're talking about, 1 Corinthians 7. So as you study this out, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's why it says, the, uh, you know, like when you go back to 10 and 11, it says that, here, let's go back to 10 and 11 again. So when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, but to the married I give instruction, not I, but the Lord. He's talking about going back to what Jesus had to say. That the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, let her remain unmarried, or, if the, or be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not leave and send his wife away. So bless you. Remember, we're all under the law of Christ. This is the law of Christ. So if your husband decides to leave you and you're doing everything you can to, to keep the marriage uh, that you've entered into, then the only way that the only thing that's going to break that is death or adultery. So eventually, let's just be honest, because the flesh wants what the flesh wants. If somebody's going to leave, eventually they're going to hook up with somebody again whether it's in marriage or whether it's just shacking up with somebody. And as soon as you have, it, it's not marriage that's the adultery, it's fornication that commits adultery. Make sense? Lewis? A couple of things. One, we go back to Genesis. The husband and wife mm -hmm. are married in God's sight. Yep. What do they become? One flesh. One. Yep. It's kind of hard to mix up, unmix, when you're making a cake. Yeah. You put, the, put the, all the, the dry and the, and the wet ingredients together. It's very difficult to break that up. Yeah. And I think God is telling you that. Yeah. It, and so that's a unified situation. But when it gets to the point that we're talking about now, yep. when I just want to figure out a way to separate the liquid from the dry mm -hmm. ingredients, mm -hmm. and I'm gone, and I do what I want to do. Yep. Sometimes we forget. We say adultery and all that. It's not the physical. We've got to remember, Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, about we can do it in our mind. Mm -hmm. But have, it's we, physical adultery, though. But look, I'm just saying, if I am doing pornography every day, never yep. going out and doing anything, and I'm still married, I'm in an adulterous relationship, in the sense, mm -hmm. in God's spiritual sense. Yeah. So the challenge right now is for us to understand, we say, well, you have to go out and do it like they did in the Old Testament. I had to go sleep with her. Before it became a sin. Right. No, Jesus said, if I'm not. I'm and this, not this is where it gets convoluted because. Know, yeah. So he, Lewis is talking about sex. Go yeah, ahead. I'm just talking about this particular issue. Well, I, I'm going to give you so a couple of things that. Let me no, no, I'm not going to more. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I talked to this one guy, and he says that he couldn't get remarried even though his wife left him, got remarried. I said, well, she's remarried. You done that? She's broken your contract. She's messed up. He goes, well, I haven't. I don't know that they're, they're actually. Consummating anything, oh unless I, unless I, unless I witness them consummating it, oh, I can't. That's the point. I can't. I, can't. I, don't, I don't think that's yeah, the case. You, you don't have to witness the consummation. I don't know. I said, How do I know they're actually doing that? I, I, you gotta, well, I don't know. You don't. You know. So, so you know. I was. So ministers talk, right? Just like elderships talk, and we lean on each other from time to time. And there was another minister that I was speaking with in Tennessee. This is the first time I was in Tennessee, and we were, we were talking about this topic. And he had, he, he had somebody. Uh, that came into his office was upset that uh, that he told that man's wife that she had the right to a divorce because he committed adultery against her. And so he came in angry, wanting to speak with him because he was under the impression, and I'm going to say this, I'm trying to say this delicately because I know we're on video and because of the people in the room, because he never actually, well, there were sexual acts taking place, but because I've never Penetrate. actually penetrated, pen I'm just going to say it, pen had penetration, that if there's no penetration, there is no adultery. And he looked at him straight in the eyes, he says, you're joking, right? Adultery 
is any type of sexual relationship or sexual acts that, uh, that are outside of the marriage, right? Any type of sexual activity that's not your wife or husband is adultery. Plain and simple. End of story. I'm sorry? No, no, I'm not talking about those things. So <laughs> that's taking a whole other whole uh, Bible study. But do you understand that, though, right? But people, but hit in his mind, I could play. He's, but looking, he's looking for loopholes. I can have my cake and eat it too, right? He's looking for I can play and still keep my wife, and she doesn't. She can't do nothing about it. Again, this is just another example of people trying to get around. Yes, trying to find a loophole. Yep. The wrong heart condition, which means that you're next. Yeah, uh, Lisa, and then Ed. Yeah, pornography is a sticky subject. I would say no, you don't have the right to remarriage. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to, because it, it's still in your mind, you haven't physically acted that out. Now, if you're going to an adult entertainment venue, for men or for women, they have those, right? And you're paying for certain services to be done to you, that then also is a form of adultery. Okay, uh, Ed, you're ahead. In I, I just. I don't know that this applies to what we're talking about right now, but when we started out at verse 10, yep. there's a distinction to be made between verse 10 and verse 12, because in verse 10 he says, not I, but the Lord. Yep. And in verse 12 he says, uh, but I say, not the Lord. Yep. So He's there's giving, a distinction there. There's a distinction because Jesus has already answered the question in Matthew right. chapter 5, Matthew chapter 90. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, they said, is there any reason I could, get, I could get divorced for any reason? And Jesus says, no, but I say to you. And he gives, the re he gives the exception. There's only one exception. There's death, and then the one exception is adultery. Then he goes, and then I say, because who is he being guided by? The Holy Spirit. And so he gives additional revelation. In Hebrew, uh, John chapter 16, when it says that the helper is going to come, I'll get to you next. Uh, when uh, John chapter 16 says that the helper is going to come, he's going to lead you into uh, all that the Lord ever said and did, and he's going to give you additional information. Go ahead. Okay. Backing up again. So, say, again, I'm married. Mm -hmm. My husband cheats on me. Yep. And we try to work it out, but we can't just get through it. And we get divorced. Okay. Yeah. Is that still? You have the you have the right. I have yeah. the right to get remarried. You have the right to get remarried, because many times, I mean, honestly, the Lord would love to see the couple stay together. If there's a if there's an opportunity at forgiveness, if there's an opportunity uh, to to remain in this covenant to 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 show grace, to show <laughs> mercy, to show forgiveness, right? Sure. Then God would love to see that. Go ahead, Kara. Okay, I'm going to play off what she just yep. said. You can't forgive them and then five years down the road say, you know what, I'm going to yeah. divorce you for. There's got to be. Yeah. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't get out of, uh, yeah, I guess in the sense there's not a get out of jail free card now for life. No, but if you publicly forgive yeah. him and privately, then yeah. you can't because bring it back up. It goes back to, though, to what is forgiveness? <laughs> forgiveness, I always often, I, I remind this to some people when I talk to them in, about marriages, right? In a marriage, forgiveness is you let it go, right? You wash it away. God says, when I forgive you your sins, tells in Hebrews, I remember them no more. But if you bring it up every five, every five weeks, that's not forgiveness. That's a reminder. Every time, you have an argument. Every time there's an argument. But, but remember what you... You see, forgiveness is forgiveness, right? But now, to your question, though... You can try to do some counseling. You can try to do some things. You can try to work on the marriage, and you're not going to be able to get past this trust, this broken trust. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, you know what I mean. I, I firmly believe that in Scripture, then you could walk away from the marriage and remarry, and it's applicable in God's eyes according to the Scriptures. And like Kara's saying, though, you can't just you know, 12 years down the road, you're mad about something else. Well, remember when you, and now I got to get out of jail free card. Right. That's not forgiveness. Right. Yep. David. Um, in, and in verse 15, um, talking about the unbeliever departing and the contract, uh, the bondage is over. Well, I, is it perhaps 
um, one reason why there's not the freedom to remarriage there because there wasn't fornication. Um, there's also a chance, though, that the one who has departed may return. Yeah. So if the one who has been left decides there are to people get who get divorced again, and get remarried, then they're going to be guilty of fornication themselves if yeah. they go out. Whereas if they keep themselves pure and the other person comes back, then they're um, then they they're still married. Yeah. Then it's gone. Hopefully back to a successful relationship. Even in Ezra. Oh, actually, I just noticed we're like one or two minutes. So we're going to continue this conversation next week because there's more that we could talk about and there's more things that we could look at that are applicable and there's principles that can be applied from the Old Testament with Ezra and others uh, that we will look at next week. So let's go to God in prayer and we'll continue on. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to open up your word once again here this morning and to make proper application of it. I pray, Father God, that you always guide these conversations. I pray that it's uh, your word that's guiding us, and I pray that we make the proper uh, application so that way we never teach anything that's an error. Father, we pray that uh, you give us uh, all knowledge and, and, we, and give us the, the wisdom to how to use it. Father, we pray for those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are suffering. Uh, we have many on the prayer list right now, and we pray a blessing on each of them as they would have need. Uh, and it's just, we're just mindful of our, our, our brother Darren, uh, who's laying in a hospital in, in Virginia, and we just pray, Father, special blessings on him. He has extensive injuries, and we just pray that, uh, Father, that you be with the medical teams that are treating him, uh, that they do their jobs to the best of their abilities, and we pray for him to make a, a, a complete and full recovery. And we pray that you be with our sister Suzanne, as uh, obviously she's just uh, filled with worry. Uh, and sadness over uh, the shape of her husband. And so, Father, we pray that uh, as we get ready to worship you this morning, that our, uh, we set aside the cares of the world. We remember that uh, great and wondrous sacrifice that Jesus made on behalf of all mankind. And we just pray that, uh, that as we enter into this worship, it's acceptable in your eyes. And we just pray, Father, that as we leave here and go back out into the mission field of the world, that we always remember who we are, and that's representatives of you. We love you, and we thank you and ask you for all things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, guys.